I have two brief questions I'd like to ask, if I may. Hi, welcome to Left Foot Media. My name is Brendan Malone and you're watching The Daily Question. Today's question of the day, how do we protect our kids from becoming snowflakes? And by snowflakes, obviously, I mean... Uh, young people who grow up to believe that they are in a perpetual state of victimhood, that every time they experience some sort of emotional discomfort or they experience a disagreement with another person that they are being victimized, that there is a need for uh, great acts of justice or protest to overcome this victimization uh, and that a great harm and wrong and evil is being done to them and their views should be sheltered, protected, nurtured and never ever challenged. Now the reason I'm asking that question uh, is because of an incident that's been unfolding here in New Zealand over the last couple of days. Uh, let, let me read you the article and then uh, it'll, it'll become clear from the article what's going on. Uh, and then I want to uh, finish by suggesting ways in which I think as parents we can handle these types of situations that will actually advantage our kids. So the, the uh, headline is, Students Mass Walkout After Principal's Wagging Warning. Now for those from other countries who don't know what wagging is, Wagging is where you bunk school or where you are truant or where you are supposed to be in school but you just don't turn up or you leave school and, and go and do other things. More than 100 Fraser High School students have stormed out of class in protest of their principal's comments about truancy at school. Students can be seen coming out of the school and gathering near the gate. A couple of outraged parents have also joined the students, which is obviously an interesting development. Uh, last Thursday, the Hamilton School principal, Virginia Crawford, gave a speech saying students who bunked school were highly likely to go to prison, either commit domestic violence or be a victim of domestic violence, be illiterate, be a rape victim, be a suicide victim, be unemployed for the majority of their life, have a major health problem, die at an early age, have an addiction, gambling, drugs or smoking. Now, so clearly she's used some pretty harsh terms there uh, to, to sort of try and warn these kids that they are not acting in their own best interest when they deliberately play truant, when they avoid school, when they should be actually learning and developing and enhancing their education. The speech was secretly recorded by a student who uploaded it to YouTube where it quickly went viral, which is sort of the new trend now where we, uh, you know, one of the things I'd be sort of probably tempted to ask that student is why did you feel the need that you had to be a whistleblower in this situation? You know, what was the great injustice that you had to blow the lid on? You had to secretly film and leak footage of this event. But that's sort of the way of things now, so you leak the footage. Uh, parents Joe Scott and Justine Kettle were unimpressed with Crawford's comments. Scott, who has a son in year 11 at the school, said she was proud of the kids taking a stand for what they believed in. Um, I think good on the kids for standing up to her. Again, my question would be why? Why are they taking the stand? To me, it's... It's not just a matter of taking a stand for any old thing. You've got to make sure that what you're actually standing for is good, true and beautiful. That, that you're not just sort of a, a, a noisy protester who doesn't really have a strong un, a sense of why you're protesting or you're not protesting for things that are actually true and things that are good. Uh, she no longer supported the principle, she said. Do I support the principle? Nah. That's an actual quote here, N-A-H. I might have last week, but not anymore. How can you support someone who's just called all our kids losers? And as we'll see in a minute, that's not actually what she did in the speech. Scott wanted to see Crawford apologise for what she said, a sentiment shared by other students who were protesting this morning. So in other words, she must apologise to us because she said things that we found emotionally discomforting. However, while many disagreed with the sentiments, some senior students have backed Crawford, stating her message has been misunderstood by the students. Older students at the school gate said she used shock tactic language to get her message across. Again, I don't understand why that would be a problem, and this is an age-old thing. I remember my principal and my teachers using shock tactic language to try and, I guess, scare us or alert us to the fact that, you know, our behaviour wasn't always in our own best interest. Students and parents on social media last week condemned the speech as demotivating and stereotyping. Any student that walks out the gate to truant is already the statistic of the worst kind, Crawford said during the speech given at the school assembly. Crawford told the students that truants wouldn't survive outside of Hamilton and pretended they were a big person in Norton, Dinsdale or Western Heights, but obviously not outside of those areas. When I drive out of school during class time for meetings and I see groups of students sitting outside the dairy, the fish and chip shop, the bus stop, 
Some of the things I am thinking is that this is another group of students without a future. That is another student who will end up as a statistic. That's another loser. That's another wannabe. Another student desperate for friendship. Another that we've lost. She urged students to put in the effort at school to make a better life for themselves. You and I know the only way to fix this is to do the mahi now, to do the work now. School is not easy, but it is a lot easier than having no hope and being cast aside without any worthwhile future. Now, any rational person can see that even though that she went into hyperbole there and she used a very extreme and forthright way of making her point, shock tactics, as the students have suggested, what she has said there is not wrong. We can also see that what she said there is an attempt to convey to her students that she actually cares about them and she wants to see them have a better and brighter future. But the reaction has been to do the storm out, to, to enact what effectively is some sort of almost like civil rights type level protest. Why? Over a principle saying things that you consider to be shock tactics? A, a moment where your emotions were sort of discombobulated, you now feel that you have to take this stance as if you're engaged in some uh, big and worthy and important civil rights battle? See, I, I would say this is not the right way to handle the situation at all. Instead, what the mature person would do in this scenario is they would evaluate and they would be able to filter using just basic human understanding and reasoning what the principal has said to them and they'd be able to take the good out of it and anything they found frustrating or they thought she, she could have said better, they would have just found a way to internally deal with and say, okay, she could have said that better, but I'll take the good and I'll leave the bad. Right? That, that's how a mature person deals with these kind of scenarios. It's how a mature person respects authority, the people who are in authority over them. But instead what's happened here is this has become this big moment of, I have been victimized, I have been wronged. I must stand and make this uh, very loud and public protest against a principal telling me that I should actually stay in school and do my best. And just because I don't like the way that she's actually said things here. So what would I do in this situation? Well, if one of my kids came home and said to me, hey, Dad, I just did a walkout today at Fraser High School because I don't like what the principal said last week, the first thing I'd do is I'd sit my child down and I would say to them, okay, let's have a talk about this. And I'd just simply start asking them questions. I would take a very Socratic approach to this issue. And I would just ask them some straightforward questions and I would start with, why did you go outside and join those other students in the walkout? What was it that motivated you to do that? What process was it that you went through where you thought to yourself, this is the right thing to do and I should join those students in that walkout? And I would begin to ask those kind of questions. What I'm really trying to do here with my child is I'm trying to get to the heart of what it was, what process they went to, what form of reasoning did they apply to this situation that led them to conclude that walking out in an act of protest outside the school, doing the walkout, was the right and good thing to do. That the, the, what the teacher had done, or the student, uh, the principal here had done was so bad that they had to take this more forthright and public course of action to, to mount a form of protest. What was the reasoning process that they applied? Now, the reason I'm doing that is because I don't just want my, my son or my daughter to understand the truth of the situation. I don't just want to have them walk away from the conversation going, well, Dad thinks that I shouldn't have done that because he thinks that's not a mature way to handle these situations and he doesn't think that I should see myself as a victim, etc, 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 when I'm not really a victim. Instead, what I want them to walk away from our conversation is having a sense of, hey, I now understand some basic reasoning. I have a tool in my toolkit that I, I can now use and I can apply in that scenario if it happens in future. If I find myself emotionally discomforted by something a teacher says, I can now process and think through the next course of action for me. I have a, a tool that I can apply, a bit of basic reasoning, and I can help myself to discern is this the right course of action or not? And if it's not, I don't do it. So I want my kids to actually start thinking for themselves and I want them to start thinking along lines that are good and are true, not just to be driven by pure, blind emotionalism. And I don't want my kids to go through life believing that every time someone confronts or challenges them or says something that they may, they may find confronting or challenging or even emotionally difficult, that they are the victims because they're not the victims of anything in this scenario. None of those students have been victimized here at all. None of them. And, and I would want my kids to understand that. The other thing I do with my kids is I actually let them fail. 
you've got to let your kids fail. You can't helicopter or lawnmower parent your kids. So you can't swoop in and save them every time something difficult or bad happens. And you can't lawn mower your way in and, and mow all the obstacles out of their way and create a perfect pristine path for them to walk through life. That is not going to help them in the slightest. So when my kids come to me and they say, oh dad I didn't get on the sports team or I didn't get into the talent quest and they're upset about it, I don't turn around and say, oh yeah you know th that's because they don't understand just how talented and awesome you really are and you're just such a brilliant person if, if only they could see that, that they're silly, they're stupid for not realizing how important you are. I don't want them to develop that mentality in life at all. Instead what I do is, and this happens quite often in our house, I will sit down with my son or my daughter and I will say, okay, let's have a talk about what happened and why this happened. Let's understand why you didn't achieve what you wanted to achieve. And I begin to get them to think about the, the, the process that led up to them not getting what they wanted. And then I begin, begin to, to challenge them with, okay, what are you going to do about it? And I ask them, I say, okay, you can sit here for the next hour, the next couple of hours, and you can be angry, you can be upset about this, or you can accept that this is not necessarily a nice feeling not to have achieved what you want to have achieved, but then you can take that emotional discomfort that you feel from not achieving what you want to achieve, and you can say, right, I'm going to harness this and I'm going to direct it, I'm going to learn from this moment, and I am going to think about what I'm going to improve next time or do differently or do better next time to try and get the outcome that I want. So I'm giving them tools. I don't want them to see themselves as victims. I don't want them to wander around the world thinking that they are the most important and special person in the world and that, that everything they think is true, that everything they do automatically should be rewarded, that everything they do is, is, is automatically right and good and, and should be celebrated. I want them to be discerning. I want them to have tools. I want them to be good and virtuous people. And I want them to be able to learn from mistakes and, and to be able to learn from adversity and, and to be able to take that adversity and harness it I don't want them to see themselves as being in a perpetual state of victimhood because they are not. That is not the path to empowerment. You will not ever be empowered if you believe that you are constantly being victimized. You constantly see yourself as being oppressed if that's how you view the world. It's the exact opposite of having empowerment. So what I want my kids to do is I want them to grasp some of those important principles about how to reason their way through things, to have some tools in their toolkit and to take that adversity and use it to their advantage. And most importantly of all, I want them to recognize that just because someone disagrees with them, they are not being victimized. Just because someone tells them something that they might find uh, disagreeable, that that person is not automatically in the wrong. That person is not committing such a great level of violation that they have to launch a civil rights level protest. No. What you need to do is engage with the person. Listen to what they're saying. Engage with their ideas. If you disagree and you think they're wrong and you think that you know the truth, make a counter argument. Back up your argument with some evidence. Make a logical proposition as to why you think they're wrong and you are right. And that is how human interaction should happen. And if we do human interaction that way, then guess what? We all start to come closer to the truth. But if we all go running off and protest any time we experience emotional discomfort, and we spend our lives thinking that we are constantly the victims of everything, and we spend our lives thinking that, that our views should never ever be challenged, none of us are going to get any closer to the truth. We're just going to end up with a very dysfunctional society where we don't have much society at all. We all live in our little silos, and we all say, don't you dare come into my bubble and ever challenge me. As per usual, I'd love to hear your thoughts, so please let me know what you think in the comments section below. And if you like the content I'm creating and you'd like to see more of it, then please support me on PayPal or Patreon. There's a link for both in the video description below. That's right, I can hear my theme music too. I'll see you tomorrow on The Daily Question.